Alex Roslin went into the Warsaw Ghetto and he saw a child die before his eyes. And he came out and he said to his wife, we have to, we have to do something. She said, what can we do? Thousands are dying every day. And he said, we can save one. It is true, we are living through a watershed moment, a turning point in our personal lives and for our world community. There are critical concerns we need to address as individuals, as a nation, and as humans sharing one planet. My goal with Spread Goodness is not to deny what's true and scary in our world, but possibly offset some of the negativity we consume on a daily basis by showcasing what is good in our world. There's a lot of it. Perhaps it will replenish us, remind us who we are at the core of being human. What a miracle it is to be here on this planet at this moment in time and possibly inspire us to do what we can to make our world a better place. This is Spread Goodness TV. Malka Drucker is an American rabbi and author living in Santa Barbara, California. Ordained in 1998 from the Academy for Jewish Religion, a transdenominational seminary, Drucker was the founding rabbi of Hamakom, the place for passionate and progressive Judaism in Santa Fe for 15 years. After that, she was the spiritual leader of Temple Har Shalom in Idlewild, California. Drucker is the author of 21 books, including the award-winning Frida Kahlo, Grandma's Lockies, The Family Treasury of Jewish Holidays, and the book we'll be discussing today, Rescuers, Portraits of Moral Courage in the Holocaust. In 1986, Rabbi Harold Schulweis, Malka Drucker, and Gay Block decided to document activities of non-Jewish Europeans who risked torture and death to save Jews during the Holocaust, a topic they considered both important and underpublicized. Their work would eventually lead to a book by Drucker, Rescuers, Portraits of Moral Courage in the Holocaust, as well as an exhibition of Block's photographs. As the Yad Vashem medal given to rescuers says, Whoever saves a single life is as one who has saved the entire world. Besides saving lives, the rescuers preserved humanity's honor. Perhaps most importantly, they inspire us today to the highest and the best we can do. Hello, Malka. Good to see you, Lisa. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And um, Malka or Rabbi Drucker? Malka. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to start off by asking you, um, well, first of all, first of all, we are discussing your book, Rescuers, Portrait of Moral Courage in the Holocaust. And um, I first, I would like to start off just by asking you, how would you define moral courage? Well, most simply, I think, uh, Lisa, it's, it's um, uh, knowing the right thing. And in their cases, for the most part, um, not being able to stop themselves from stepping into a place of danger to do the right thing. Not being able to stop themselves from doing the right yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean... Even in the face of danger. I mean, yeah. I always felt they sort of had, like, it was so involuntary, the way they described it, that it's like they had an allergy to injustice. Mm. Yeah. How would that definition of moral courage be relevant in the world we're living in today? Mm-hmm. Well, I, you know, it's a very good question because I often uh, think about who are the rescuers now? Who mm -hmm. are the people? Yeah. Who would uh, most say? recently, yeah. uh, I think, is uh, Cassidy uh, Hutchinson, Hutchinson mm -hmm. who had nothing to gain by doing this and only to lose. Yeah. Um, the women who stood up to Harvey Weinstein. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in these cases. So I think that those, those uh, yeah. women, and then there were young women like uh, Emma Gonzalez at Parkland, you know, who created a movement. Yeah. Uh, so I think that those are the people that I, 
I, I think of. The, the phrase came from my rabbi, Harold Schulweis, moral mm -hmm. courage. Mm -hmm. And uh, it always seemed to me to be about, uh, you know, we know about the Olympian athletes, you know, sort of the highest level of uh, what one can do with one's body. Mm -hmm. Well, the, these people have always shown me the most that a person can do with their souls, for sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to hear how this book came about first as an idea and then what the journey looked like. And I'm wondering if you could just kind of take us along on that journey. Oh, good. Thank you. I like that question. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had written about 15 children's books before this book. Yeah. And so I thought of myself in the community of uh, children's book writers. Um, in 19, it was like 1985, 86, uh, I was going through a divorce. And uh, it was a really hard time in my life with my children and everything. I was just, and, um, and there were people in my life who were really there for me. And one of them was my rabbi, Shoas. And he said to me in, at this period in my life, um, his passion was acknowledging these people. Nobody really knew about them yet. Um, um, the Schindler's List had come out as a book, but he was a somewhat compromised rescuer. I mean, he wasn't given the medal at Yad Vashem right away because he was paid. You know, it was a little different. I understand. Um, he benefited by what he was doing. Got it. Yeah. Um, but Showwise had met one, uh, t t two young men who had been saved by one of these people. So Schulweis heard from these two young men that they really wanted to find the, the, the people who saved them during the war in mm -hmm. Warsaw. Okay. And, and then he just became, my God, you know, there's this whole population of people who risk their lives mm -hmm. to save Jews, some for a half an hour, some for years. Wow. And that's when I, you know, and I think that the idea of goodness um, mm -hmm. and my personal circumstances at the time made it even sharper for me is why I really, and the first interview I can show you was this woman who was smoking. Okay. And, uh, she, you know, I, I remember her rescuer, I mean, the, the one she saved was sitting next to her and translated from Polish. And the energy of these two women wow. and, and, and hearing her story, and I just thought, whoa, you know, I, this is a book. This wow. Is a book. And that, was, that opened the door. And then, then we interviewed somebody in Southern California. Yeah. He's also there, Bert Bokova. And, um, and then, uh, then we uh, traveled to um, Israel in, in 87. And then we went to Europe in 88. And overall, I think we interviewed about 111 rescuers, uh, all told. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a boring story. I, I mean, every story imagine. was amazing. Yeah. And uh, the exhibit at MoMA was based upon images. Mm -hmm. The book was based upon stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Which I find extraordinary and yeah I mean that that the stories are what can teach us and what we can learn from right and, and in some cases it's inspired by the smallest example like one of the women remembered after World War one as a child going with her mother to visit people and then seeing her mother slip money between the tablecloth and the table mm -hmm. and others spoke about people coming and staying with them who were in need over the years. So, the ex so those were some, but some were motivated because they had terrible parents. I don't, can we back up? I'm, yeah. I'm curious, what did you, I don't know if I followed or tracked the story with the money being slid under the table. Can you give me well, some more information? I, they, they, they realized that their mother recognized these people needed money. Okay. And, they and were they the people that they were giving money to, the rescuers, or? Well, no, these were just, like, be, after World War I, there was great poverty in Europe, especially in certain places. Okay. So this was in Belgium, was the story. Mm -hmm. And 
realizing as a child that these people really didn't have very much, yet they would give you what they had, you know, mm -hmm. for a tea, whatever. Right. And the mother wanted to be able to help them and knew they would never accept an outright gift. I understand. So then they came, you know, and they, and, oh, look at that. You know, yeah. They found a way to help that's, that's without, it. That's I understand. It. Yeah. And the child remembered that. That's right. Seeing that's that. right. And, and I, so in some cases, it was mm. clear the example from childhood motivated them. Mm -hmm. But not in every case. I mean, that's, what I, that's why I had so okay. many faces on the cover. Now I see. Because mm -hmm. there are so many paths to goodness. You bring up a really great point and uh, a really interesting point. And I read a book called The Originals by Adam Grant. It's I don't know. It's vaguely familiar. It's a study that analyzed the actions of non-Jews who risked their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. Mm. Adam Grant references the study conducted by two sociologists after Oliner. World War II. What? Oliner. Sam, Sam and Pearl Oliner. Uh, I think you're right. Actually, I recognize that. Yeah. I read the book, and now I recognize right. that name. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, in his excellent book, Originals, How Nonconformists Move the World. So that's Adam's story. I mean, book. Wow. In the study, the authors called this group of non-Jews rescuers. They called a similar group of non-Jews who did not try to save anyone non-rescuers. The study revealed that what ultimately differentiated the rescuers from the non-rescuers was how their parents had disciplined bad behavior and praised good behavior. And it goes on, this article goes on to say, when the rescuers were asked to recall their childhoods and the discipline they received, the word they used most was explained. Their parents had focused on the why behind disciplinary actions, providing moral lessons rather than simply punishment. Grant notes that by explaining moral principles, the parents of those in the rescuer group had given their children an appreciation of the importance of complying voluntarily with rules that align with critical values and of questioning rules that don't. Interesting. Um, I met Sam and Pearl Honor. Really? I remember having them over. Yeah, their book came out before mine, The Altruistic Personality. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I read it. Mm -hmm. And Nahama Tech wrote a wonderful book, When Light Pierced the Darkness. Sam, it was a lovely image, you know, this bit of light, you know, in the darkness. Um, I, d I don't agree okay. with Sa Sam yeah. and Pearl. Okay. Um, that wasn't your experience? No. Let me see. Uh, From what okay. you observed? No. Um, mm -hmm. Now, in every case, I don't remember everybody talking about, oh, look at that. It opens right to the page. I love when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> so this woman. Okay. The Countess wow. Maria Maltzon, Greffin Maria Maltzon, mm -hmm. a veterinarian, interviewed her in East Berlin. Uh, in the house where she, she hid Jews. Yeah. And let's see, I want to see if I can actually use her words here. Mm -hmm. Here, my mother hated Jews and told me never to marry one. Wow. It was easy for me to resist Nazi authority because I had always resisted my mother's authority. Oh, interesting. That, that doesn't follow no. Sam and Pearl. No. No. Okay. I was... Um, I would always be very active with my eyes. I'd come home and tell my mother what I'd seen, and she'd say, stop your lying. So one day I stopped, and she couldn't get me into a conversation after that. It nearly drove her mad, but why should I talk? I had my school friends to talk, to talk with. Um, when I was 13, my father called me to his deathbed to say, you know, your mother doesn't like you. Try to be polite and do what you should do. I think it was because she was such an unjust person and treated me so unjustly that I have such a strong feeling for injustice. Wow. So maybe, I mean, that might be right from a sociological perspective mm -hmm. that this is a good thing to do with children um, and that they grow up to be moral beings. Mm -hmm. Yet I would say, and again, the reason, I mean, I have atheists here, I have you know, nuns here. Yeah. I have uh, illiterate people. I have, uh, you know, you know, PhDs. Everything. I don't think that, I think the, it's the, as my publisher once said, the glory of the human spirit 
that it, 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 you can't have it. I mean, they're sociologists. They're going to tell you that res there are five characteristics, you know. You know it, but one of them that I really agreed with is mm -hmm. that they had this intolerance to injustice. And they'll claim it's because of their parents. Yeah. And I'm going to say, we all have three parents. One is supernal. So mm -hmm. when I think of uh, Maltzon, mm -hmm. I think it wasn't the influence of the two earthly parents, mm -hmm. but it was the influence of the third parent that made her who she is. Interesting, yes. And there was an influence of the parents because she had practiced that's resisting. That's right. That's right. She, that's right. So, so the, look, you're going to be like your parents. You know, it's the same coin, one mm -hmm. side or the other. I mean, there's a, there's a guy here, he was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he was in Glendale, and he had, actually it was very successful, started a business. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how many people wanted to be rescuers, but they couldn't. They didn't have the courage, for example, you know? And, Did uh, you talk to any of uh, people like that? I never, no. Okay. I, that the, wasn't your focus. Well, no, well, one thing is, is few people would admit to you sure. that they... How are we going to find people exactly, like that? Yes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then there were those who did risk their lives and they mm -hmm. lost them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was easy. We didn't, you know, obviously... We can't, right. So the only ones I got to speak to were the survivors of those years of right. that experience. These two guys were best friends and this one, you know, like, well, why did you... you know, why did I do it? I mean, they could be cats or Eskimos. I couldn't see this happening to them, you know? And one of them, you know, like, was it difficult to hide the Jews? Div I mean, God, they, you know, they looked like 10 Jews. Is what they, you know? So it isn't that they all, you know, came from this place of, uh, it, for some. Altruism and, It's why I said right. it was an allergy. You know, there, there were just some people who couldn't bear to see what others turned their eyes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are there are parts of that I that I highlighted that we'll go into that relate to what you just said that mm -hmm. some people just turned turned away. Mm. Interesting. Most. It. Yeah. I and mean there most, are four people. Yeah. You've got victims, persecutors, mm -hmm. rescuers, and non rescuers. Bystanders. Bystanders, yeah. Yeah. Um and they're most. I think the metaphor I used was a teardrop in an ocean of indifference. Yeah. A teardrop meaning the people who rescued versus an ocean of indifference. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the, one of the great lines was that uh, in Jacob's rescue, uh, this, these were the, the boys. One of the boys that went to Schulweis was, said, uh, that um, Alex Roslin went into the Warsaw ghetto and he saw a child die before his eyes. And he came out and he said to his wife, we have to, we have to do something. She said, what can we do? Thousands are dying every day. And he said, we could save one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned this ocean of indifference and obviously that has turned, that tide has turned, and there's people who care, look back and say, how could this have ever happened? Um, and that's why it's our battle cry to say, never forget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what I remember all, I mean, I learned, I grew up yeah, in having Highland a Park, very I bet you did. There was strong such a education. Skokie, yeah, 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 Right. for sure. And so it's, it's, it's definitely, you know, etched in my memory, never forget, never forget. And of course we have holidays that remind us the, the Holocaust Remembrance Day to never forget. Um, and yet somehow, somehow we get to a place where um, we're not taking the lessons from what we learned. We can look back and say, oh, that was horrible. And yet things happen today that seem like we could we could go back there that we that could happen sure. again. Oh yeah, I mean you can Ellie articulate Wiesel, what I'm yeah. trying to say much yeah. better than I can. No, no, yeah. I mean Ellie Wiesel, you know, I mean remember during the Milan massacre during mm -hmm. Vietnam, it was like my generation, you know, and he couldn't bear to witness it and do nothing mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, he'd, because of his own experience. So I, you're right. absolutely right. Or. Rwanda, or oh my God, Ukraine now. How is it then yeah. that people can still turn their heads? You know, to what's hat, to the small, to the, 
what happened in the Holocaust obviously didn't start with the Holocaust. It started with small right. things that happened along the way that, that right. turned into right. um, this atrocity. Right. Right. So we, I think there are a lot of people in this world right now who notice these small things that could turn into bigger atrocities. Oh my God, George Floyd, I mean, here in our own country. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's everywhere. I mean, it's enormous injustice. Yeah. Uh, um, I have no answer for you, Lisa, yeah. about why uh, we don't learn, still. and and you know, um, you know how much well, how much more has to happen right. before we awaken as a species mm -hmm. and save ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no idea. Um, I'm this only grateful for these moments, and just as the work that you're doing now, my rabbi had the same motivation. People must know. And nobody wanted to know in the Jewish world about rescuers. Well, I remember you telling me this, and that was one of my questions yeah. actually about the, um, you mentioned your publisher, but it, when you were when you were looking to get this published, nobody wanted to publish it. 23 you tell uh, us about rejections. That? Oh, there, my agent, I remember Curtis Brown, who was a juvenile agent, but still she looked at the pictures Oh, uh, old people. I mean, nobody's going to want to look at pictures of old people. And she was Catholic from Iowa. She was saying, well, you know, and uh, there's a lot of controversy about the Pope uh, and, and, uh, and, and those people, rescuers, mm -hmm. who were writing false documents. Like, there was a sin mm. in doing false documents. And I remember, like, looking oh, at my agent. Oh, so and that saying, would deter people. You're yeah, saying, you know, like, like it was a bad thing they were doing, even though they were saving lives. They did these. They were lying. You know, huh. <laughs> looking wow. at looking at Marilyn Marlowe, like, mm, you know, of um, uh, the different, pers you know, realizing the different perspective of it. Um, so I think that, yeah, that that um, it Jews couldn't stand the idea that they were rescuers for a time. I remember the first time I gave a talk, before the book came out, I was in, uh, I think it was in Canada, and uh, I go into the bathroom afterwards, and there's this lady who comes out, she's about my height, and she looks at me and says, tell me, did you interview any Austrian rescuers? She was had an accent, and I yeah. said, uh, and before I could answer, she says, you didn't, because there weren't any. There were no... Is that true? No, of course not. But from her perspective, and I, I mean, there were plenty of times when I, we would give the talk, mm -hmm. and this was the good news, the good news about the Holocaust. And I would right. always start out by saying, right. you know, it's a nice looking book, uh, nice pictures and all of that, mm -hmm. but, um, but always before I begin, we have to remember, again, the, the, the metaphor and of the teardrop and to mm -hmm. recognize that um, so many, so when you ask the question, you know, when so many didn't respond then, right? Uh, that's how most, in every, it's always like that. It's like you it's don't see it until you're so far beyond it and look back and say, how could we not have seen that? Yeah. So these people are exceptional. You know, these people are, you know, but there are people who do a lot of good in this world. They really right. are. You know yeah, that. That's and why the work that you are doing, doing. Yeah. is very good. I believe you know? that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, so for me, um, I guess I've come to a part, a, a part of my life where I just, I, I, can't, I don't look for the global solutions anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, uh, I just pay attention to uh, these acts of loving kindness in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you participate in those actions in your corner of the world. I try. Yeah. I think you're doing it. I try. <laughs> I'm just reading through some of my notes. Sure. But this is the question that I had prepared, but I think we might have just covered it. But I said, um, it's hard for me to believe that, that, that you had a hard time finding a publisher because it seems so important and so, new, so unique. I studied a lot about the Holocaust growing up. I remember Lois Lowry's fictional book, of course, Number of the Stars, that, that children read in usually fourth grade. Um, of course, Anne Frank's Diary, Schindler's List, as you, you recalled already. Um, we know there are rescuers, but I feel like we only know of a few. 
And so I'm shocked that that a publisher wouldn't want to to share the stories. Flannery O'Connor wrote, I don't know if I have it in the introduction or not, or I read it later. I think I might have read it later. Um, she wrote that, you know, what I understood is, is that people don't mind hearing about um, the Dalai Lama or Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. and they see them as exceptional. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not me. Mm -hmm. They don't mind, you know, hearing about Hitler because that's not them. Mm -hmm. um, extreme. But to know that there were people like you and me who did this makes people very uncomfortable. Goodness makes us squirm, is what I learned from O'Connor. That uh, people are very uncomfortable seeing someone like them do something that they cannot do themselves mm. or choose not to do themselves. And the fact that somebody like you has done it demands that you look at yourself in a way that you don't want to look at yourself. And I think that's why the book is rejected 23 times. I think it's exactly for that reason. And the publisher ultimately who published it was the daughter of a survivor from Vilna. And, I, and so she had, so it was Holocaust. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so much about rescuers. She wanted to do a book about Holocaust. Okay. And, um, so she had a personal exactly, exactly. connection to the material. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and, and to this day, if you think about it, nobody, I mean, you know, so Schindler's List came out, it was a movie, that was a good thing, thank God for Spielberg, this book came out, still, you don't know a lot about people like this in the world. Yeah. And I think it's just because we sort of look at each other and like, what, what, well, what can I do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And each of them said basically, nobody, like, you know, again, all in her, I'm going to disagree, I was going to say, one mm -hmm. of them said, um, what do you think? We sat down at dinner and said, oh, let's save some Jews? That's not how it works. Right. You know, it's in the middle of the night. Somebody knocks on your door. Will you take my suitcase? Mm -hmm. I have to leave. Or will you take me in? Mm -hmm. And then you become involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I remember you telling me about that, the, the goodness, and I found that such an so interesting mm. to reflect upon. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I mean, I keep wondering about that. Mm -hmm. How true that is. I mean, I'm, I know it's true, and I just wonder if that really, um, if that's conscious. I, I don't think that's a conscious thought that people have. What? I the, don't think it's conscious that people don't want to read that because it, it, it threatens oh, whether no, no, or not they a, will choose right. to do that. That's right. Yeah, I think that I remember um, I had this conversation with a friend of mine at least a couple of years ago now, and I can't now I'm not re really remembering the exact yeah. context, but... It was, I, I would like to think I would do that, but I wonder if I actually would. Well, so that, so that was, you know, when, when I would, uh, you know, talk about the book, I would say, look, the first thing I did ask myself was, you know, could I have done what they did? Mm -hmm. But then I realized that the real question they were, they were putting in me that I couldn't stand is what am I doing now? Mm -hmm. That was really. Right. Yeah whether or not we're faced with the impossible. Right, um, right. What am I willing to sacrifice right. yeah, of my life? Those dilemmas, yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah. You know, we like, find our edges in You can dilemmas. imagine that, you know, like, yeah, my God, you know, it's like, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, what am I willing to do? Mm -hmm. in my, how much discomfort am I willing to have in my own yeah. life? I've been in moments in recent days and, yeah. and years where I'm like, gosh, I hope I'm safe doing this. You know, uh -huh. I was asked to speak on, on the news um, now two years ago, um, and I was afraid. I did it. I, I spoke, but I was afraid because it was, um, it, was a, it was in response to a hate crime, and uh -huh. um, I wondered if it would make me a target. Exactly. I was fearful. Exactly. And they asked me, do, do you feel comfortable because this could make you a target? Wow. And I... I did choose to give the interview, but it didn't make me not scared. <laughs> no, well, I, th I think that, I don't think you're not scared. I think you just, uh, you know, like we've talked about overriding certain things, mm -hmm. if we can override right. our fear. Right. Yeah. And I do remember saying exactly what you said at the beginning, which was, I can't not do this. Yeah. Next time on Spread Goodness TV. Are there any stories that stand out to you or that seem to be singed in your memory? 
she was 18 years old. And he had 19 Jews living in his basement. He didn't know it. What? That, and that's what she did. <gasps> yeah. I mean, they rescued the honor of humanity. They, they rescued um, our belief in what we were capable of as human beings. Help us build our online community. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook and consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. On a Sunday afternoon, you know, between five Germans, Soviets, Nazis, and a German shepherd. Going about barking and doing this. And my husband and I sit in the chair, we have to sit in Bustos in the chair, and I said to my husband, very so rude. He said nothing, he said, what are you talking about? If you would like to support our ability to provide uplifting content inspired by members of this community and communities around the world, please consider becoming a sponsor. For more information, email lisa at spreadgoodness.love or visit spreadgoodness.love slash sponsor.